One of the reasons why mullet are, for me, such an addictive species is, yes, the challenge, they're not the easiest fish to catch, so there's certainly a, an enormous sense of achievement when you do finally connect with one. Yes, there's the fighting prowess of the mullet. Uh, you know, a six or seven pound mullet will give you a heck of a scrap, I and mean, you can certainly be expecting to have that fish on the line for 20 or 30 minutes if it's a big thick lip. Um, but for me, it's the sight fishing element. Uh, the, the phrase that's often used about mullet is the British bonefish um, and there is a very good reason for that. If you look at the water that we're standing in now, it's six, seven inches deep, it's crystal clear, it's a pale sand bottom. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that it's about 10 degrees cooler, you could almost think you were wading on the flats of Cuba. And you're sight fishing, so you're looking for those fish, you're looking for the behaviour of those fish to change in your favour and for that feeding behaviour to, to switch on. Um, and there's nothing quite like the thrill of casting to fish that you know are feeding. You're stalking the fish. It's not blind casting. It's not hoping that those fish are going to turn up. You build a library of experience with mullet fishing. You know where those fish are going to be or, or can anticipate as best as you can in fishing at least anyway. Um, and you can put those flies right where those chances are going to be maximised for you. All fishing's a bit of a roll of the dice, but it's all about moving the odds in your favour. So today I'm using the, uh, the Romy's sand shrimp, which is these uh, yellow gold shrimp patterns here on a size 12 camasan. Um, probably Colin McLeod's most successful pattern. I would have said that's accounted for more mullet than anything else in the UK. Uh, I'm fishing that on the dropper actually. I tend to fish that one on the dropper and leave it there because that's a, a good fall back and then I can cycle through different flies on the point. At the moment I'm fishing one of the blue variants which is a relatively recent addition which is proving to be very successful on the point but equally um, this dark green version is proving to be very successful in my neck of the woods. Uh, a lot of my home turf is in South Wales. I fish the surf beaches and that, uh, that green and tan shrimp has been highly successful. I had four nice thin lips uh, out of the surf just yesterday on that so that's a new one in the box and I'm very happy it's there. I do have a few natural patterns that, uh, that I tie up as well. These are sort of broad imitations of Corophium uh, mud shrimp, which are the little shrimp species that you see crawling around on the bottom. It's something that forms quite a big part of the diet of mullet. Uh, just occasionally I like to go along a more imitative route um, and it has helped me on, on those days when the fish are particularly fickle. Uh, the red ones, incidentally, the shrimply red, work extremely well for thick lips during the first two months of the season, so particularly May and June, and then for some reason after that they lose their potency. So most people when they're stripping for mullet tends to do this. It's usually a lot quicker than most people imagine, like this. We're trying to imitate a fleeing shrimp in a rock pool. So instead of that, try a little bit quicker. So for me, uh, the optimum setup is um, a six weight. Um, I have the Orvis Helios 3D 
uh, saltwater configuration, which is a beautiful rod. Um, but you know, you don't have to go in at the at the top end. Um, there's there's uh, a great deal of scope uh, in terms of the quality uh, and level of the of the kit that you can invest in. I would tend to say invest more money in the reel than the rod to start with because reels really do get tested in a saltwater environment. You need a good clutch and really you need a sealed clutch, otherwise you will eventually run into problems. I've seen plenty of, of cheaper reels give up the ghost within two or three trips in the salt. And there's nothing worse than uh, having a fish on the end and then your clutch seizes and you, you snap off. It could be your only chance of the day. Now, obviously, for mullet, we're using quite small flies. Uh, so it's not like you've got to hoof a great big bass fly six inches long, uh, 20 yards out. We're using size 12 shrimp patterns. Um, we use long leaders because in water as skinny as this, you can see it's only ankle deep and there are fish moving around us at a distance. Uh, you need to make sure that you don't drop the fly line straight onto the heads of the fish and spook the whole shoal. Um, so long leader, so it's a nine foot uh, bonefish leader, tapered leader, fluorocarbon, uh, 10 pound. Um, and then in addition to that, there's an extra four to five feet um, of tippet on the end, uh, fishing a team of two flies, one on the point and one on a short dropper about a meter up from the point. People do ask, is 10 pound overkill? Uh, it, it isn't. Um, if you hook a big mullet, they are real head shakers. And so anything less than 10 pound, you won't necessarily increase your catch rate, but you will increase the number of fish that you lose through break-offs. Uh, it's happened to me plenty of times. So good quality tippet, fluorocarbon, 10 pound to match the leader is absolutely fine. One of the things to remember about mullet is that they present uh, a viable opportunity for the traveling angler. If you're going on holiday abroad, uh, it may be South America, it could be the Caribbean, it could be Europe, Spain, France, Portugal. Take your fly gear. Mullet are found in all of those seas and oceans and they present fantastic sport opportunities for the traveling angler. So one of the things that greatly concerns us in the mullet fishing fraternity is the uh, really worrying proliferation of illegal netting uh, that seems to have exploded in the last few years, but generally the commercial pressure on mullet stocks over the last 10 years. You've only got to go back that sort of uh, length of time, 10 years, and they were regarded um, pretty much as a crab pot bait had little intrinsic commercial value and as a consequence uh, fish stocks are very good. Uh, since the restrictions have come in on bass fishing then I think it's only natural I guess that people who make their living out of this uh, have turned their attention to other things. There are no protections in place for mullet. Uh, a little bit of clever remarketing in some of the restaurants from grey mullet to silver mullet has boosted their popularity and now they're regularly seen on the menus, they're regularly seen on the fishmonger's slab where they weren't. 
Now, I've got nothing against that. Uh, you know, people have got to make a living. That's absolutely fine. Uh, but what we don't want is the same situation developing with mullet for us as, as anglers and for conservation generally that we've had with bass. They have the same growth rate. They grow at the same rate as a bass. Uh, you know, a double figure thick lip could be 20 plus years old. You don't have to net that many fish before you can collapse a population. You remove the breeding uh, age fish out of that. Uh, people assume that mullet are, are quite migratory and that if you empty fish out of one particular area within a few days or a couple of weeks, new fish will move in to fill that void. But actually we can tell you from experience that that doesn't happen. We've been doing this for long enough now to have seen areas utterly devastated by commercial netting and illegal netting. Uh, and those, uh, those particular marks, which were incredibly prolific, were just wiped out for years. Uh, so we don't want that to happen. We don't want to be 10 years further down the line. Uh, all the people just coming into mullet angling now, suddenly finding that they're in the same position as many of the bass anglers are, where they've got to travel a phenomenal distance to find quality fish. That really would be a tragedy.